Uh, hi everyone, uh, I am uh, Shai Malin, together with me, uh, Orliana Patel. Uh, we're from NVIDIA, uh, and we would like to talk about uh, NVMe TCP offload. Uh, this was uh, a joint work uh, with uh, Boris Pismani, Yorai Zak, Ben Benishai, and uh, Or Gerlitz. Uh, regarding the agenda for this session, uh, we're going to talk about the motivation uh, for NVMe TCP offload. Uh, we're going to talk about the challenge uh, with solving the problem. Uh, we're gonna show the design, um, the performance that, we're re that we were able to achieve uh, thanks to this design, and we'll end up with a few debug lessons uh, from this work. So let's start with the offload opportunity. And uh, in order to understand it more, uh, I will explain a little bit about the NVMe TCP PDU. So the NVMe TCP PDU contains a header uh, typically, it's 24 bytes, uh, which explain what, uh, uh, what exists in the PDU. Uh, in case of data PDU, the data could, could be between 5 to 12 bytes up to even 1 meg. And at the end, we have the CLC. The CLC is also called as data digest, is calculated over the entire data section of the PDU. Um, on the transmit side, the transmitter needs to add those four bytes at the end of the PDU. And on the receive side, we need to calculate it and compare it uh, to what exists on the, on the PDU. Uh, so what are the opportunities that we have? Uh, so first of all, uh, we have the receive side zero copy. And uh, that's the main one. Uh, and in addition, uh, we have the receive side uh, CLC validation and uh, the transmit side, side CLC calculation. Um, if we'll be able to accelerate and offload uh, those, uh, those flows, uh, we can benefit from it. Uh, let's see, uh, again, the motivation, but this time on Flame Graph. Um, so Flame Graph shows on the x-axis the distribution of the CPU load. And on the y-axis, we can see the call stack. Uh, this was captured on a uh, host side. Uh, we can see a workload of a FIO running high queue depth of 128K IOs, read IOs, uh, on a single core. Uh, in this case, uh, it's mainly RX traffic. Uh, on the left, we can see uh, the TX uh, path. And actually, the bigger part is uh, the RX path. And uh, especially a function which called uh, copy to iter, which performs the data copy. As we can see here, it's a pretty significant portion of the CPU load. And this is actually even without uh, the CLC. Once we will enable the CRC, um, so first of all, the, the total, the, the total um, load of the CPU is, of course, higher. Uh, and we can see on the right uh, also the portion uh, which is wasted on the CLC validation. Overall, this is what we're trying to save uh, with the offload. Okay, and now let's uh, understand better the challenge. So uh, let's discuss about NVMe TCP PDUs versus TCP segment. A single NVMe TCP PDU uh, could be spread over multiple TCP segments. So in this example, it could be that the first segment will contain the header and the first part of the data. Later, the second PDU will contain only data and it can be list of PDUs uh, with this structure. And in the end, we'll have a PDU uh, with data digest. On the other hand, it could be that a single TCP segment will contain uh, multiple uh, PDUs. That's the expected uh, behavior in case of very small PDUs. So no alignment is guaranteed here. Okay, so the challenge is uh, that TCP receive data in anonymous unaligned buffer and PDUs uh, out of order is allowed. It's meaning that the remote end is allowed to reorder the PDU that is sent into the uh, receiver. Uh, because of that, a generic uh, receive zero copy will just not work. Uh, the solution, this requires uh, to track the TCP stream and to distinguish the NVMe PDU headers based on the PDU header, CCCID and PLAN. The CID is the unique identifier of each IO, and the PLAN is just the size of the entire PDU. And let's understand better the design. So we'll start with a simple uh, a flow of the in order. Uh, it all, it all starts with the fact that we identify the TCP connection based on the four tuple uh, steering rule. 
Uh, later, we need to track the TCP stream and identify the NVMe, P N the NVMe TCP PDUs uh, in their stream based on the PDU headers, which include the CCCAD and the PLN I just mentioned. In case of data PDU, we'll perform the following two uh, uh, things. First of all, we'll perform the DDP, the direct data placement, which means to place the data directly into the end buffer in the relevant offset, which is based on the TCP sequence. In addition, we'll perform CLC offload, which means calculate uh, to start calculate or depends on the TCP segment to continue to calculate uh, the data digest and to verify the result uh, once we got the end of the PDU, uh, which includes the data digest. As we can see here, so let, let's understand what it means. Um, we can see here two PDUs. The idea is that based on the PDU header, uh, based on the CID, the unique identifier, of the IO and based on the P length, the size of the PDU, we can understand that this is the data which is expected and we'll do the direct data placement. And we also have the, the CLC at the end and we'll calculate the CLC over the PDU and we'll compare it uh, to, the, uh, to the result. Okay, um, so uh, bottom line here, we'll uh, perform a complete DDP and CLC offload for all the PDUs. To okay. Um, okay, now let's understand better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now let's underst understand better what is done on the software layer and especially um, how the SKB is built. The packet headers are from the receive ring, uh, as we can see here. Also, the storage protocol headers are from the receive ring, but the main thing is that. Uh, the payload is from the destination buffer, which is our end buffer. Uh, later, when the SKB is consumed, and this is actually the best part here, uh, the, stotle, the storage protocol will skip the data copy if the source and the desk buffers are the same, which is uh, the case uh, here. Okay. From here, let's continue to the uh, more complex part, which is out of order. Uh, so, as we understood, based on the PDU header, data len, and the hardware can anticipate which TCP segment range is within the current PDU. Uh, if the missing TCP segment is in the middle of the PDU, the hardware will continue the uh, DDP uh, in the following packets. In this case, the data digest will be calculated by software. We are not allowed to calculate data digest out of order. Um, so, in that case, we don't have uh, any alternative, and it will be calculated by software. And when the missing packet will arrive, uh, the hardware will bypass the offload um, and will go to the regular flow. So in this example here, uh, packet number four was dropped. It means that uh, the offload will just continue with the following packets, but will not be able to perform a DDP or CLC offload to packet number four. Okay, and with that, let's continue to the more complex part. Uh, what will happen uh, in case that the missing TCP packet include a PDU header? The hardware will pause the offloading, and in the next following packets, the hardware will compare the start of the packet, of the packet with the magic pattern. As optimistic approach, uh, in case of a match, the hardware will send a recent request to the software. So magic pattern uh, is based on a few uh, um, attributes in the PDU header. And if we have a match with the expectation magic pattern, we'll assume this is a header and we'll uh, send the recent request, which contained the PDU header and the TCP sequence to the software in order for the software to confirm. Um, in this example here, uh, we can see that packet number two is dropped. Uh, as you can see, it's include this time a PDU header. Um, and in that case, uh, in packet number three, there wasn't a match for the magic pattern because we don't have a PDU header. Um, but in packet number four, we will have a match. And in this case, the hardware will send the recent request to the software. The hardware will continue to track uh, the incoming stream, but this time without performing any DDP while it is waiting for the recent, re recent response. Once we will get uh, the recent re response, uh, the software recent response, uh, the, the software will resync the hardware uh, with a new state, uh, meaning confirm, confirmation uh, of the magic pattern. 
Uh, and then the offload could, could continue with the following packets. So what we can see here is that uh, for PDU number two, we'll not be able to perform the DDP and the CLC offload. Same for PDU number three, but starting from PDU four and above, uh, it will continue as normal. Uh, important to emphasize, uh, the resync does not terminate the offload or stop the RX from receiving incoming packets. Uh, that, of course, will continue. We don't want to stop any of it. And with that, let's continue with the TX part. So on the TX part, uh, instead of computing the NVMe TCP uh, PDU data digest by software layer, the driver marks the uh, marks the packets for data digest offload based on the socket the packet is attached to. The how to identify the packet is required is requiring data digest offload handling and perform data digest calculation of the PDU data. It replaces the PDU data digest and TCP checksum with the correct values. Both the device and the driver will maintain the expected TCP sequence values in order to handle retransmissions. Retransmission of a packet in the middle of PDU will not require to be handled uh, by the offload IO path. And if the retransmission includes the PDU data digest, the software will resend the entire PDU to the hardware, which will calculate data digest on the entire PDU, but then it will send only the packet which contain the data digest to the wire. Uh, the reason is that we cannot do a partial uh, data digest in that case. We'll need to calculate it for the entire PDU. Okay, and now let's say uh, understand uh, all the flows that we have here. So it all starts with the enablement. Uh, the enablement um, include a, a, a module param, uh, which will add to the NVMe TCP, which called the ULP offload. Uh, and in addition, uh, we'll have a net filter uh, called ULP DDP. Um, actually, it's under discussion also on the mailing list, uh, but this is our current approach. Uh, later on, the offload for the IOQs is initialized after the handshake of the NVMe TCP protocol is finished by calling NVMe TCP offload socket. The operation sets all the relevant hardware context in the hardware. Um, and then on the IO path, and this is per IO, the NVMe TCP layer will call a setup DDP to map the IO buffer and to configure the hardware for the specific IO. So what we need to do is actually to map between the uh, IO identifier and the buffer for which we'll like to do the uh, di direct data placement. This flow is opportunistic and in order to avoid the waiting for the hardware completion. So the idea is that we don't want uh, to wait for the hardware to be updated with this context. And in this opportunistic approach, uh, we are firing the uh, hardware update while issue uh, the command. And uh, we know that it's much more likely that the hardware will be updated uh, much faster than before the remote end uh, will reply with the data. Um, but just in case, this is uh, totally OK. And if it will not work, uh, just that specific PDU uh, will not be offloaded. Uh, once the IO uh, completed by the NVMe TCP layer, but before posting the completion to the upper layer, a tear down DDP will invalidate the hardware buffer. Uh, also, we have the resynchronization flows uh, that we discussed before. We have the resync response that the hardware is sending to the software, and we have the confirmation, uh, the resync, uh, sorry, the, we have the resync request that the hardware is sending to the software, and the resync request, which include the confirmation. Okay, uh, what are the changes that we are suggesting in the SKB in order to allow it? So um, we are suggesting two new bits, uh, ULP DDP and ULP CLC. Uh, this is, by the way, similar to the uh, TLS approach in which uh, the SKB decrypted uh, was added. On the transmit, the SKB ULP CRC indicates uh, to the hardware that CRC offload is expected. On the receive, SKB ULP CRC indicates to the driver that no CRC errors in the packet failed. Uh, just to emphasize, uh, ULP CLC equal to zero uh, means that we need to trigger software PDU CLC calculation. On the receive, uh, SKB ULP DDP indicates to avoid SKB condense. Uh, this is in order to avoid a redundant copy uh, in this flow. Regarding the enablement, uh, so in order to enable the NVMe TCP offload, uh, we need to do two things. Uh, first of all, to enable it on the device level. Uh, this is uh, using e tool k 
And the other thing is that we need to enable it uh, on the protocol level. Uh, this is by a, a new module param, NVMe TCP uh, ULP offload. And following uh, the enablement, all the NVMe TCP uh, queues and sockets uh, which are running on the device are offloaded. Okay. Um, the examples that they presented here in the previous slides were actually include, of course, simple cases. Uh, it's hard to really estimate uh, the performance and the impact of all of those cases. Uh, in order to evaluate it, we actually have the performance section, which Olian will explain. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. So uh, thanks, Chai. I'm uh, Aurelien Aptel from NVIDIA Networking Team. And uh, let's move on to the performance results we were able to achieve. Uh, this feature is part of NVIDIA new uh, Connectix 7 network interface. Uh, okay. So uh, first, the test config. So in order, um, in order to test the NIC, we've done all of our measurements on the Intel Xeon CPU uh, for both the host and the target. Uh, this system have 160 threads, which uh, is plenty enough since we only use uh, one thread per connection. Uh, we use the kernel 5.19. Uh, we have uh, we use obviously the Connectix 7 NIC. Uh, the NVMe target uses a null device as its backend. Um, topology is pretty straightforward. The host and the target are connected back to back. Uh, each have a 100 gig Connectix 7 NIC. We use IPv4 with a maximum segment size of uh, 1500 bytes. Regarding tuning, uh, this is the part I want to emphasis. Uh, the host uh, system doesn't require any tuning. You just load the NVMe uh, TCP module uh, with all the parameters that I presented. Uh, you load the, the, yeah, the module, the driver, you enable the floating, and uh, it will just work. So everything is properly handled. Um, for non-offloaded measurements, uh, we used RIFS to uh, pin CPU to, uh, to receive queues for better performances. Uh, we do this because uh, in offloaded mode, the driver does something similar by adding steering rules directly from the code. So to make the comparison uh, more fair, uh, we decided to use RFS. <clears throat> uh, we also made sure the NIC uh, would use the same amount of combined queues as the number of jobs. Uh, this is all in order to minimize context switches and CPU migrations, which uh, I will talk later on about. Um, you want to have uh, NVMe processing running on the same core as the network uh, receiving. And finally, for the workload, uh, we use the FIO to generate reads of different sizes, uh, and it's all submitted using libAIO. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at the bandwidth differences between offloaded and uh, non-offloaded. Uh, we only look at uh, DDP offload on this slide. <coughs> CRC will come in the next slide. Uh, let's take a look at the first graph on the on the top left. Um, on the x axis, uh, you have the different I/O sizes we tried. Um, on the y axis, uh, you have the bandwidth in gigabit per second, and for each I/O size, uh, you have the green column which represents the offloaded bandwidth, and in gray column the non-offloaded uh, bandwidth. We also call it software. So the higher the, the column, the better. Um, so uh, yeah, one job means uh, one FIO job, and each job runs on uh, different uh, CPUs. So you, you can see that starting around 16K to 32K, offloaded traffic takes the, the lead. And as the IO size increases, uh, so does the bandwidth cap. Um, we have similar measurements for four jobs and eight jobs. Uh, so uh, for one job, uh, we, we for 512K, we get up to 35% higher bandwidth. For a four job, this goes up to 48%, and for eight jobs, it's 55. So uh, now let's enable CRC offload and uh, look at the same uh, comparison. Uh, this is where we see the biggest gains. So the hardware will outperform the software starting around, again, uh, 16 to 32K. And we can uh, almost uh, double the, the, the gains. Uh, we can already see great benefits from yeah, 16K IOs, and it just keeps getting higher after that. So um, yeah, at most for the eight jobs on the bottom right, um, you can see it's up to 138% higher bandwidth. We're very happy with this result. <clears throat> so on this slide, uh, we'll look at the cost CPU cost uh, comparison. So the offloading also reduces uh, CPU usage. 
So on the x-axis, you have the I/O size uh, uh, we tried, like before. On the y-axis, you have the CPU utilization per thousand I/O. In this case, lower the lower the column, the, the better. So uh, as expected, you can see a similar advantage here. From 32K, you can see the gap starts widening. Uh, so you get a better usage of your CPU and a better bandwidth too. So it's pretty good, pretty nice. So now let's look at uh, the performances under network congestion. Um, in complex net topologies, we can expect packet drops. So it's tricky to simulate all possible uh, scenarios of packet drops, as it can happen at different levels uh, in the system and at different frequencies. Uh, this is a whole, uh, we, we could spend a whole full session on this topic. So uh, what we did here is simplifying the behavior by dropping packets on the remote target. And we do this by uh, using the tool uh, TC, traffic control. Uh, we had the queue discipline on our NIC to randomly draw transmitted packets at the rate of our choice. So the, the command is up there. Uh, and the square bracket is where you would put the percentage uh, of loss uh, you want. <clears throat> so we tested it with ranges of drop ratios <clears throat> going from 0 to 0 0.3 to 0.7 to even 1%. And uh, this drop will decrease software performance by, uh, as you can see, around 10 to 20%, depending on the workload. Uh, with the 1% drop, you can even see that software uh, performs, uh, 50, there's a 50% uh, drop. <clears throat> so with uh, with higher drop ratios, we see worse performances. But with offload, uh, with all drop ratios, we see a consistent advantage. Uh, so you can see, uh, yeah. So um, uh, we've looked at different drop rates. Now let's look, uh, let's focus on uh, point, uh, 0.3 packet drops. Uh, and four jobs with just uh, the direct data placement. And uh, let's look at different I.O. sizes. On the left, you have uh, performances without drops. And on the right, you have the one with the 0.3 drops, 0.3% drops. We can see that starting at uh, 32K, we get better bandwidth with offload uh, in, in, both, uh, in both cases. With the drops, uh, the overall uh, performance is lower, which is expected. But we still see a consistent advantage uh, with offload. So you can see that the gap widens again uh, as the IO sizes increase. And it's always better. <coughs> now let's enable a CRC offload on top of uh, DDP. <coughs> uh, again, it's a with, we're comparing with and without packet drops. Um, on the left, you can see the performance without the packet drops. On the right, you see with 0.3% packet drops, 0.3 packet drop. Uh, again, overall performance is lower as expected, uh, but you can see that for any of the I/O sizes, we get a consistent advantage over non-offload. In again, so um, yeah, we we still uh, doubled our bandwidth at 512k I/O. The, the gap uh, just keeps getting higher as the I/O gets higher. <clears throat> so during this project, we faced uh, different issues. Uh, we learned a few things uh, while working on them. Um, I thought that would be interesting to talk about uh, two of them. So the first one is uh, that uh, context switches uh, can be expensive. I was already familiar with this notion, but what I didn't realize is how many switches ended up uh, happening. It's only after doing some measurements from uh, perf and adding up uh, the cost across all the CPUs used in, in the workload that I saw the overhead I created. Um, these switches uh, are a result of interrupt being fired by the hardware. Uh, so every time the hardware sends an interrupt, you have to do a context switch. Um, we would get one for every PDU offload setup. So for every PDU, we, as Shai explained, we have a setup. And uh, the setup has a completion. And this completion is an interrupt. And since the, so yeah, it's a lot of uh, interrupts. Since the offload is opportunistic by design, uh, which means the hardware uh, offload if it can, and if it cannot, it takes the regular software path. Uh, so since it's opportunistic, we have no special things to do uh, upon the completion of the setup. So one of the things we did was just to uh, skip the completion notification uh, entirely. And this cut down the number of interrupts, which cut down the number of context switch. Uh, so on the graph, you can see the amount of context switch per second uh, we would get before this uh, fix. So uh, once we enabled offloading, it would double, and yeah, this is not good. Uh, I've put the perf command we use to generate flame graphs, uh, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, yeah. So the second lesson I picked is uh, the impact of GRO. 
Uh, Jirao is an optimization to bundle multiple uh, received packets together in a single SKB before you pass it down the, the, the pipes. Um, by reducing the number of individual packets, uh, we save up uh, the overhead uh, added for each SKB. So yeah, this is what SRO does. And it only, so Jaro only um, works by grouping packets in our design, which had the CRC uh, computed by the hardware. And uh, in our initial design, we would use the same uh, bits to track the CRC calculation and the DDP. Um, and so packet would be flushed early and it resulted in smaller SKBs, which defeated the purpose of the Jaro optimization. Uh, so we just fixed this problem by uh, tracking CRC and DDP independently by using two different bits. So this early flush wouldn't happen. Um, luckily enough, there are enough free bits in the SKB structs. So we were about to add them without increasing the, the size of the SKB struct. And in order to check on this uh, metric, we just did the uh, network traces using TCP dump. And with T-Shark, you can just, uh, from the command line, T-Shark is the command line version of Wireshark, you can just... Uh, pointed to a trace and asked to see the minimum, maximum, and average uh, uh, frame length so to check Jiro was doing its job. Um, all right, so we submitted all the patches. Uh, it's been a couple of versions already. Um, last week, we submitted version 6 uh, and 7, actually. Um, so um, any feedback is welcome. Uh, if any maintainer is in this room, uh, that would be helpful to, to talk with you uh, later on. And uh, am I forgetting something? No? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So we submitted the, the, the patches to uh, NetNext and Linux and VME since it touches different subsystems. And uh, yeah, that's it. <coughs> any questions? Um, I have a lot, so I'll let other people ask first. Oh. Any audience? Anybody needing a mic? No. Okay. I guess uh, no one interrupted me. You want to... No, I, I just want to point out the core kernel changes are very beautiful. Very few lines. Then I'll let Fujit say what he wants to say. <laughs> yeah, so, so one, we actually talked a little bit about, I think, uh, uh, the current patch set is extremely NVIDIA hardware specific. It's command by command, uh, piece by piece, like the way you guys have offloaded it. I think there are other architectures that don't need it, that granularity, which just becomes overhead, right? You're putting a check in every command issue, and it's very initiated heavy right now, not not target heavy. So, so and that's fine, we can evolve it, but think of the framework as what happens if the framework was not very specific. Um, and a couple of important questions. So the CRC, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, maybe I can uh, call uh, to yeah, the yeah. first one. Yeah, sure. uh, so I believe that the, the ULP infrastructure uh, was built in order to uh, allow different vendors uh, uh, to support it, or also if it will be a full offload, which not involve the, the IO packs. The ops are good. Uh, it's the where it's inserted right now. Is what I, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, the so one thing I didn't understand is why was the CRC so expensive? Because in the software part, the packets are already the payload is already in cache, right? Is and checksum doesn't typically come up with such a heavy cost in addition so, to CRC. So so CLC uh, is a CLC thirty two. It's the same as uh, in iSCSI. It's actually much heavier than uh, the TCP checksum. Uh, for that reason, uh, it's much more expensive to, to do it by software. That, that's a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and you guys skipped the header digest. Or has the header digest done some better? Uh, two, just because uh, the header digest is calculated just over uh, 24 or up to uh, 64 or 72 uh, bytes, uh, we don't think it's worth it. Um, so in that case, we are just doing it by software. Uh, as we see it, it's not the main. Uh, it didn't show up on the flame graph. Uh, no, not much. Okay. Uh, and the last one I didn't understand was the, in the scheme that you have, right? I mean, as the frame, as drop rate increases, your efficiency should take a more dramatic drop than what I saw, because you will effectively have to retransmit the PDU and you'll get hit on receive and transmit. So uh, why was it so good? Uh, I expected it to be, because it just, right? Uh, so, so I think that the drop rate that uh, we were running uh, 
is not very high. I mean, we're talking about 0.3. 0 .3. 0 .3. By the way, it could not be much, much higher just because the overall bandwidth will be much lower. Uh, so overall, by the way, this is what we're looking for to see. Uh, we saw that the impact was not that big. Um, yeah, I think 0.3 is reasonable. Yeah. Most people would say that's... So yeah, good. Good job. Anyone else? All right, fine. Mic. Unless somebody can get the mic. Hey. Um, so in the beginning, you said that uh, it recognized a five topo in order to uh, match the disconnection, right? And I'm wondering if it can work uh, in a tunnel situation. Hey, what, what was that? What was, can if you repeat the, the end of the question? Okay, I'm wondering if it can work in a tunnel situation, if the disconnection is encapsulated in a VEXLAN or a Geneve tunnel. Uh, so, so currently, no. Uh, but uh, definitely we can see how it can be also supported. I mean, Thanks. Logically, it's just as long as you get a TCP packet cool. that you can identify, it's a filter selection in hardware. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, I don't think there's anything on the bridge. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.